Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Learn with Jason. Today on the show, we have Steve Sewell. Steve, how you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good. I I, uh, I just realized I didn't ask you how to pronounce your last name, and I, I may have just butchered it. You nailed it. I it did. Awesome. Okay. All right. Good. I was like, I said it out loud, and then I was like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> No, you nailed it. Um, so, Steve, I'm I'm super excited to have you on the show. Uh, but for those of us who are not familiar with your work, can you give us a, a little bit of a background on yourself? Yeah, of course. And so, um, I mean, I think it's similar to a lot of the topics on your show. I'm a huge fan of the Jamstack, the very modern sort of component-driven, very rich client-side sort of uh, front-end development. Been a fan of it for a long time, dating back to like 2012, back when it was probably a bad idea <laughs> for most people, but it was <laughs> it's exciting. It was like, let's make these really fast, slick, feel like a native mobile app sort of websites, especially for shopping and other things. And so I've been dabbling with sort of the front end frameworks and tooling for a while. Also been a little obsessed with no code. Uh, my background in development was originally on the design side. I just wanted tools to let me whip up sort of apps, but I think for a lot of reasons that's never existed. And mm-hmm. so anyway, Recently in my career, I sort of joined a company called ShopStyle. I was leading their web engineering team and they had this very dated tech stack. And so we, we brought them to be more modern and we were on Angular, uh, which was super popular at the time, still of course is. And uh, it was awesome. We were one of the first sort of like fully single page application e-commerce experiences. That oh, cool. was super cool. Yeah. But one thing we noticed really quickly is e-commerce stores, um, are very much driven by their marketing teams to sort of mm-hmm. like create pages, merchandise products, like show these products to these visitors. And we had the super slick sort of front end application, but we had no really good way for them to actually whip up these pages and try and test these different experiences. And we found that, you know, when working with sort of the new stack, a lot of these sort of legacy tools didn't fit well. They would try and use, you know, jQuery style JavaScript and sort of inject an A-B test and stuff. It wasn't a good fit for the performance, that kind of component driven development and, you know, a lot of other aspects. And so in getting this huge flood of, you know, we need to build this page, we need to modify the homepage, we need to run a test. Uh, we were just hand coding up all this stuff. And I was like, no engineer likes to do that, right? They want to make their components, make this beautiful sort of design system, and then ideally hand that off. And so you're not actually like coding up the layout of pages. Rather, you make this great okay. design system and your marketing team can decide, I want to show, you know, this hero with these buttons on the homepage, maybe some products personalized to the person visiting the homepage and whip up landing pages and stuff like that. So we realized that was sort of like the need, but there wasn't really a tool to fit that. Like in theory, you needed like a web flow that was component driven and could hook up to an Angular or React or whatever type of website. And I remember at the time I was like, I don't know if that's possible. That seems a little out there, but I was kind of bored with my job and I thought I'd give it a try. So I started coding up the initial version of Builder, which was this idea, sort of register your, in this case of shop style was Angular components Mm -hmm. and let your sort of non-developers compose pages out of them and just quickly whip up, run A-B tests, et cetera, and not have to bang on your door like, hey, I need a new page, which is really just the same components and just a different arrangement. Uh, And usually in ways more intricate than like a standard headless CMS can do. So that was sort of the generation of Builder. And uh, now we have a good bit of customers, a lot of fit in e-commerce and otherwise, Shopify apps and, and all sorts of stuff. Cool, yeah. And and so Shopify apps are kind of where we're looking today, where we, we are like, so, and this is something that I think is kind of exciting, right? Is, is that we're starting to approach this level of like, the good thing about the Jamstack is it unbundled everything. We, we weren't stuck with these monolithic solutions where we could build in whatever front end language we wanted, but we could use whatever back end we wanted to manage the data. And that meant that we could mix and match. We've got the, you know, our blog should be handled from something that's built for blogs and our, our e-commerce should be built with something that's built for handling product data and all because like there's so much that goes into an e-commerce platform. We've got fulfillment, we've got uh, order tracking, inventory, sizing and variance and like all of these things that just really like you can do it with any system, but wow, is it a lot of work to build, to do on your own? Um, Absolutely. And so when you when you start looking at like what is the benefit of using something like Shopify, it's that right. You you're like sure I can build something, but like let's just talk about a T-shirt, right? So I have a T-shirt. That T-shirt comes in two colors. Uh, I also want to do like a, a slim fit and a a kind of straight fit of this this T-shirt. And I want to do it in a range of sizes that will fit everybody. So now I've got 
one shirt, two like two color variants, two fit variants, and so let's say eight or nine size options per shirt. Like we're managing a lot of products with independ like indep uh, independent inventory numbers for each. So I you know I have to keep track of not just how many shirts I have, but how many black version in the extra small slim fit I have. And I need to track orders, where things go, how much money did I make? Do I need to collect taxes? Like all of these things that suddenly start to add up that just turn into a huge, huge, huge amount of work. Um, Absolutely. And, and, and that's why, you know, the Jamstack is so exciting is that I can use Shopify for that, but then I don't have to use Shopify to run my blog, which exactly know, I would prefer not to use Shopify to run my blog. I'd prefer to use something like Prismic or Sanity or, or Contentful that that's built for that type of content. Um, but exactly. this introduces a problem. So the problem is all of the nice parts about using monolithic CMSs, like we get these drag and drop interfaces, this really, really tight coupling between the front end and back end, which means you can do these very flexible UI driven kind of no code page builders. That starts to get way harder when the back end can be literally anything. And so what you're saying is that what builder is aiming to do is, is sort of bridge that gap and get us to where we do get to keep our data wherever we want to keep it, the, the right place. But we provide front end primitives that that we can then kind of mix and match. So we still get that sort of like UI driven, no code experience that's that's friendly to somebody who doesn't want to get into a code editor. Exactly. No, you're spot on. And even to build on your example of like the intricate sort of shirt example, one thing that is is hard today if you don't have sort of some higher level interfaces is building out that Jamstack Shopify store in the first place, right? You want it to be fast. I mean, we all sort of, you can Google it and see a bunch of studies that the speed, the load time of your store has a huge impact on how many people buy products from your store. Uh, I actually just moved to a different area of San Francisco where there's not much cell reception. And I've been mm. forgotten that like, like you don't always have super fast LTS and I can't load a lot of e-commerce websites because, you know, to your shirt example, you might have all of these variations. You might want to show some like components for choose the right fit or explore mm. the options. In a traditional stack, you're doing that with jQuery and you have this global JavaScript that's blocking and injecting and it's just very bad. And so when you're trying to load these sites, just not loading when you can use like Next.js, and modern platforms, you can make this stuff lazy loaded, very rich, feel like a native app and just sure, load yeah. instantly. But, you know, where a lot of people kind of go today is they code it all up from scratch, right? Mm -hmm. And they forget the fact that all these people who have these cool sizing charts and experiences, your marketer is going to give you, or your marketing team will give you a long list of sort of updates they need. We have these new products that need to new different types of sizes and all this stuff. The back end can handle it, but the front end, it, it makes everyone's lives easier if the marketer can go in, click on what they want make the changes. The primitives, like you mentioned, can render to React or tomorrow you want to be on Vue, cool. The next day you want to be on iOS, cool. It's all there. It's all yeah. decoupled, like you said. Nice. Okay. Well, th so this sounds really exciting and, and, um, and, and it, solves, it solves what I think is, is kind of a, a, a key benefit of these, these more like monolithic approaches is, is that you get this kind of unified experience. And, and so we're trying to bring that forward into the Jamstack so that you can also have a unified experience without sacrificing all of these benefits that you get. Like you said, the performance, the the portability, you know, that stuff is is so important, especially in like bigger teams. And you've got multiple teams working. Those teams don't want to be st like you don't want to have to be a, a, at the leadership level of a company saying from this day forth, you are only allowed to use React because that's what we built our system for. And, and like never ever shall this change because we know that's not true like we've if if for any of you who have been uh you know chat this might sound familiar if you've been in an enterprise company every few years we say this is the way and it's never going to change and we start overhauling everything and 80 percent through the project we go oh boy this was a bad call and now we've got the previous legacy app on top of the new legacy app while somebody cooks up a plan for what the next this is the way is going to be um, but yeah, it's, it gets rough. Right. And so, uh, yeah, it, yeah. Like Chris is Chris in the chat is talking about coffee script, which I mean, <laughs> coffee script is great. Should we have forced everybody to use it no matter what? Probably not. No. Um, and, and it just makes migration hard. So what I like about this is that 
it um, it does something that I, I really like, which is a, a phrase I repeat, optimizing for deletion. You know, we, we want to make pieces mm -hmm. of the app easy to swap in and out um, so that they can be built the way that we want them to be built, but so that if we decide that we need to change or evolve, we only have to change that one piece. We don't have to rip the whole system out to make a change. And that, I think, is really, really important. Um, yeah, it's huge. But and especially... Uh, go ahead, sorry. So No, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I just say in your enterprise sort of company example or any company with multiple teams or just interdependencies, even if you're just like a one person shop selling products, but you need to use an agency for development or, or whatever outsourced, just anytime one team tells another team how to do their job, <laughs> it drives everybody crazy, right? I need you to build this page in this way, or I need to do this thing in this way or mm -hmm. whatever, or like we... On the developer side, it could be like, we made you this nice landing page template. You can fill in the text and this button. And then the marketers are like, this is the worst thing ever because now today I need two buttons. And now I have to go back to the developers and ask for a second button and it drives everyone crazy. But it happens every day. You sell a promotion that needs like a shop men versus a shop women button. To that, going back to developers drives both the marketers crazy. They probably have a timeline for this new release or promotion. And the developers crazy. They drop what they're doing to add another button. It's, it's infuriating. Sure. I've, I have real work to do. And so, yeah, when you kind of can decouple, optimize for deletion, all that stuff, everyone could be happy. Marketer makes the ads to the button, but the button is a component the developers made that always has a certain look and feel, a certain behavior essentially managed. And mm -hmm. both teams can just do what they're doing happily for once. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love that. Um, and yeah, so I think at, 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 at this point, we could keep talking about this all day. I, I honestly would love to, it's very exciting, but I wanna make sure that we have plenty of time to get things done. So let's switch over. And let's take a look at what we're actually going to build today. So we'll get into pair programming view and let's take a quick second to do some shout outs here. So first of all, as usual, this episode, like every episode, is being live captioned. Uh, we have white coat captioning with us today, making all of this work uh, so that it is more accessible to more people, which uh, that means a lot to me. It's on the homepage, learnwithjason.dev, if you want to follow along with the captions. Um, that is made possible through our sponsors. We've got Netlify, Fauna. Auth0 and Hasura all kicking in to make this show more accessible. That uh, helps me keep the lights on, helps me uh, you know, pay for things like captioning. And that is very, very much appreciated. Remember that these are links, so you can head over to the site and click these buttons and go check these companies out. Um, while, you're, while you're checking things out, make sure you go check out Steve's Twitter and give him a follow. Um, we can, uh, you can follow, get a, get a lot of information about Builder.io and, and what else? What else do you tweet about, Steve? Um, talk a lot about front end development, faster development, um, sort of framework, flexible development. We have this really cool project called JSX Lite that powers our code generation. So I talk about updates to that, um, sort of a cool way where you can write, um, components as this subset of JSX code, but compile mm -hmm. it out to Angular or brand new cool framework. So I don't know, open source code, e-commerce builder, the whole range of stuff working with designs, design systems, you get it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, and so today what we're gonna do is we're going to build a next app with Shopify to manage our our data, and then we're going to use Builder.io to, to build the front end. Um, and then we're gonna deploy that whole thing on Netlify. Okay, yeah. so to make that happen, I've made a Shopify, here we go. I made this Shopify site. I did not put anything in it. Um, I figured that we could walk through that together, but I, I wanted to to get uh, get us set up so that you didn't have to watch me um, put in the, like you have to put in your address and stuff for, for Shopify. <laughs> um, other than that, I haven't Good done idea. anything to prep. So I'm, what do I, what do I want to do first if, if we're going to make this happen? Yeah. So let's start with, before we jump into the readme, let's go to your Shopify store and just add some products. And okay. I, I can explain the background for anyone tuning in. This is kind of cool. One thing that you can do with Shopify is what they call dropship products. And so one way to make products is just what Jason's doing now, enter the information, um, give it a price, all that stuff. And that takes a little time to input and you'll have to manage the inventory and whatnot. And there's another sort of exciting option too that we can do here in a second where we can actually use an app. In this case, we might use Oberlo to drop ship products. Meaning mm -hmm. if you follow this, this Twitch stream, you can actually get a live store up and running today, deployed and everything and actually selling products that you don't have to ship to anyone. You choose products um, from sort of like an open list of things that you can sell, plug it into your store. And then when orders come in, 
uh, and actually a third party will send that to your customer on your behalf. It's pretty neat and allows you to actually test out your marketing skills. Can you make a beautiful site and can you actually start making money without worrying about having products and inventory and stuff like that? Nice. Yeah, that's that's pretty excellent. I have no idea what these are actually going to cost, so I'm just going to make that happen. <laughs> uh, we're not going to deal with taxes today. Um, and it would be like something like that so that we have a, a, a skew for it. And let's Perfect. say that we've got 10 of these available so that they are going to work. Um, I also don't know. I don't know, half a pound, that seems right. And then uh, do I need any of this? Am I, am I just doing things that I don't need to do right now? Um, in your case, I think you're okay. And let's give it a variant so that we can do this. Cool. We'll we'll say we've got a, um, we'll give it a black version and a, what other color should I do for this hat, chat? I think, oh yeah, the, the, the hat. Let me see if I can get like that. It'll be like this. That'll be the hat. I'm actually going to get this made. I'm really excited about it. <laughs> purple. Okay. So purple will be the other hat color. Um, so we're going to do, we're going to do that. That'll be good. And we'll say that we've got 10 of each. All right. I'm ready now. I have perfect. I have my first product. Is that, is that cool. enough to get us started or do you want me to do a second one? I think that's fine. Okay. Um, we can do the drop shaking example if you want to plug in other products or we can just work with the one. I think working with the one totally works too. Yeah. Let, let's start there. And if we've got extra time, we'll, we'll come back and add more. Sweet. Sounds good to me. So yeah, let's pop over to the readme and, or actually I could walk you through some of the steps sort of already, but if we maybe scroll down a little bit on the readme, just to give people a, a sense of sort of what we're going to do. We have one little video walkthrough. That's cool, but yeah, there we go. So in the getting started a little bit lower, the first steps will just be create an account with builder. So if you haven't done that, why don't we just do that? We can pop into a new tab, just go to builder.io and start the account creation process. I have not done this, so let's do it. I'm going to cool. do one of these. And not that one. Um, let's let's generate an actually <laughs> secure password that I didn't just show to everybody. <laughs> okay, you come over here, and then I'm going to generate a password. And... Okay, good. I agree. All right, I'm just gonna save that so I don't have to remember how to do it right now. Perfect. Okay, I create software, that sounds like me. Um, we're gonna use next today, so we'll copy that. And all right, Perfect. I'm in. Great, so let's do something. So instead of creating a space from scratch, we're actually gonna generate one for this starter. Okay. So go over uh, on the left-hand bar is a little kind of circle user icon at the top. Yeah, the one that says uh, account. Cool. So let's go over to your private keys. There's a little pencil button next to the private keys row. Great, and let's open that. It won't display the key, don't worry. And okay. let's copy it to your clipboard. You can hit the little kind of copy button. Got it. Okay, great. Let's go back to the readme and we'll kind of follow the readme steps from here. All right, so Ooh. I have my key. Perfect. And we did that, did that, and we copied it. Okay, so now we get to work with the CLI. So let's start by cloning this project. Okay, so I'm gonna make this over here, we'll move this over here, and then let's, uh, let's start by um, GitHub clone I get lost? I got lost. Where did it go? Right there. Uh, Builder.io, next.js, Shopify. That's cool. Is that an alias you have in Bash, or is that like a this is the GitHub It's the GitHub chain? CLI. Nice. I need to use um, that. How about that? That seems good. No, what have I done? Oh, I have to do the <laughs> GitHub repo clone. There it goes. Yeah, the CLI is, is really, really nice. It saves me a ton of time. Yeah, no, it's awesome. Okay, so I have I have that. Um, I can Perfect. npm install, or actually, is this a, it's a yarn project? Oh, no, it's a both uh, project. Oh, God. 
Is it a both project? Oh, I think we left it open ended. Let's do uh, let's do npm, but we actually don't have to install just yet. But we oh, need to okay. do. It's okay to stop. do it now though. Leave it. Leave it. Okay. It's okay to do it either way. But let's install the builder CLI. So this will let you. This is kind of cool actually. So. What that'll do is allow you to sort of take this starter and set up a builder space configured with different models, kind of like other headless CMSs. You can have different models for your content. I think okay. our structure here is we might have like a home page model, a product page model, and then some other little sections that you can edit in builder, which is kind of cool, like a spot for the cart or a spot for like an announcement bar. So this will just kind of pre-configure it all. So you want to do that um, builder create commands. Okay, so I'm going to do builder create and then yeah. I need a key uh, and then yeah. I'm going to put the key in here and then we'll give it a name yep. and the name yes. is going to be whatever I want. Whatever you want. And the key is what we copied before that might not be in your clipboard and you probably don't want to show it pasted because this is a private key. You don't want people to have access to your accounts. Right. So I'm going to, I'm going to head back over. Uh, I'm going to pull this off screen, paste this, and then we'll, we'll clear this terminal. Yeah. Okay. So I'm running this command. It'll do a few things. Are you seeing like the little loading bars like sitting? Yeah, up I, like I'm that? clearing it off the screen here so that I can pull it back over. Perfect. Um, okay, so the the private key, the command is right above where it says builder IO CLI here, and that that's uh, the command that we ran. So it wrote the home page, uh, did the announcement bar, cart upsell. So I don't know what any of that means. So what what does that mean? What happened? Yeah, we'll actually show you in a minute. I think the okay. next step is to go into the builder space and we can kind of explore it. Okay. So maybe let's go, let's go to the readme really quickly, just so I can make sure I'm I'm not crazy here. Oh, there you go. You've got the space. It did the thing. Yep. It did the thing. So we can just hop right into it. Excellent. Okay. Cool. So now that we want to go get our Shopify keys, so I can walk you through that as well as the, so this is like a demo store setup, but we're going to want to leave this nice. window and go grab your actual Shopify store information so we can attach to the data like we talked about. Okay. So, so yeah, go to the apps section. It's kind of weird. So I'll explain this really briefly. In Shopify, to get keys, you make what's called a private app. Exactly. Manage private apps. And this is really now, sneaky because you would come out here and you would go, I need an app. And then it's like, right. you go here, but you have to scroll down and then there's this sneaky little button. Yeah. So the funny thing about that is, um, and they're going to show you all these. Yeah. They're going to make it look really scary. And the reason why is a lot of um, Shopify's customers are not technical. And so if anybody is just telling you, oh, create some keys and paste them to me. Well, now they have access to your store. In your case, you're a developer. You can read this and understand the API terms. Um, but they want to make sure people aren't just like blindly clicking through and generating keys and, and sharing them to people who should not have that level of access to their store. Wait, there's no sound on my overlays right now? Unacceptable. Let's, <laughs> let's reload that, everyone. Give me just a second. All right, try it again. Try it again. We should have sound. What's happening? Why? Why? I don't understand. I don't know what happened. This is like, I haven't changed any settings since last Thursday. <sighs> okay, well, here we go. Um, fine. Fine. Sorry, everybody. I broke everything and I killed your boops. I, it's all, it's all bad. Oh, thank you for the sub Cassidy. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Come on, little compooper. Uh, yeah. I don't know why that's not, I don't know why that's not doing what it's supposed to do. Here we, here we go, I guess. Um, that's fine. I'll fix it later. Today, today you will have to deal with just the sound of my voice and the crooning of Steve. Um, Sorry, everyone. <laughs> All right, so so I'm going to enable private app development here so that we can uh, yeah. we can make this work um, by enabling. Man, they really they're like, do not press this button. <laughs> they don't. I'll tell you the other sort of like secret, but not secret. Um, some app developers don't like to pay. You know, on the app store, if you have an app, you pay like a thirty percent fee of any revenue you make. Shopify oh. has a similar deal, and some app developers are like, I can make a private app. <laughs> you know, tell people I follow these you, steps, I and you. I don't have to pay. And they're like, no, 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 no. That's why it's like verify you meet the terms, this and that. In your case, that's not what we're doing. We actually are following the rules, which is we're making a custom storefront properly. I understand. Okay, cool. Um, and thank you so much for the raid, Mutual. Welcome, everybody. Uh, 
what were y'all working on today? What's 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 going on? Um, okay, so I have a private app, and I'm going to create a private app. Yeah, and now we can give it a little bit of permissions, probably a name, and then you'll choose some scopes so I can nice. do that. Basically, we need the app to be able to see your products and some basic stuff. Oh my goodness, a a stream game called Rattle Royale, a snake game, but a battle royale. <laughs> Sounds so much fun. Um, okay, is, is there a, a like? Should I call this a certain thing? Builder next JS. You know that's what I did in my demo stores. Uh, it's just pointing to this is the app for this custom storefront that you're making, whatever you want to call it. Got it. Okay, so we can make that work. Um, I've got my admin API. Do I need any of this stuff? Yeah. So let's let's hit show inactive. Ed. Cool. Actually, yeah, sorry, there's two pieces. Yep, that's one. Let's just okay. give uh, read access to products. So if you scroll down, some of our customers, products, there we are. Change no access to read access. Okay. Cool. Do we need any of the other down. stuff? No, I believe we're good without any of that. We'll okay. keep it nice and simple. And then in the storefront, check all of those boxes. This all is it. all just read only. Yeah, I want to see tags. I want to see products. I want to see customer information. We can use that to power. One cool set of features we have is um, segmentation. So you can actually have different visitors see different content, even with all the Jamstack optimizations. And we can power it by that, which is kind of neat. I'm, I'm really starting to regret this, uh, this decision to let people move things independently on the screen. I don't know if you can see <laughs> that they've placed a dumpster fire in the middle of my face. Uh, cool. Cool. Thanks, chat. Makes me feel makes me feel loved to know that you want to put trash on my face. All right, so we're creating this app. <laughs> Linda, you're welcome. I, ooh, that would be a good tattoo. I yeah, I feel like that's uh that's that's how we do things now. What is going on, Shopify? I think it's still loading. There I it hope goes. it's still loading. Okay. Have API cool. credentials. Beautiful. Okay, now we're going to copy and paste those over into the builder tab. So let's grab that API key first, and I'll this tell one? you what box to put that in. Yeah. And it goes API key. Very top. Yes, exactly. Okay. And then storefront and then, API key. Yep, you're in the right place. Keep going. There you Here. go. Storefront access. Yep. Here. And then yep. I need this API password. Exactly. And I think you can copy and paste that without it displaying here, too. That's, yep. Here we go. Here we copy. go. Everybody get Cross ready to fingers. steal my secrets. Okay. We're good. There you go. Now let's then, add uh, your store name. Exactly. And it'll need to be .myshopify.com, the full domain. Cool. Okay. There we go. And I'm going to... good. I can't read this button because I need to click this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to assume that means save it. You want it. Yeah. And click OK on that. Okay. So what this is doing, this is one important thing to know that we do for you. So the one... Um, Here's the cool thing. Cool thing about Shopify, it's been around a long time, tons of integrations, very robust. The one downside is they're not really always optimizing for you know, a Jamstack uh, storefront. Their APIs have uh, occasionally aggressive rate limiting that could actually mean the products just disappear from your store because you can't access them because you've hit a rate limit from too much traffic. Maybe a deal mm. is happening. So the thing you said yes to just now is we're creating a copy of your products that stays in sync over here in Builder as a data model, like another headless CMS. So you can use our APIs that don't rate limit you to pull that product um, with high speed into any scale. And we install Webhook with Shopify to always keep it in sync. So you still manage it with Shopify and we're gonna pull it from Builder, if that makes sense. Yeah, 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 okay, that makes sense. Um, cool. And so how often do I have so to let's run do, that? Oh, it's automatic. It okay, only okay, has to cool. run one time and it'll be in sync forever. Yeah. Gotcha, cool, that's cool. Okay. Um, so now you, you're in the sort of the builder CMS view. I think once we actually get things set up locally, it'll be sort of more useful and interesting to sort of like explore the structure here. So maybe let's come back to this and just go and actually set up that um, next JS application, which actually involves, you'll see on the readme, we're going to actually have to take a couple of those keys that we had done prior and yeah, add it to some env files. So the next JS okay. site can also be aware of this stuff. Got it. So uh, let's see, I haven't opened that yet. So let's open this up. Cool. And in here we have, let's see, we've got some stuff. Uh, we've go. got an env template, we've got production, we've got development. Um, probably want to yeah, use you development want... for now. Oh, yeah, there's stuff that. already in here as well. 
Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So that's just the demo stuff. And so let's, let's paste our stuff. Um, so let's go back to that Shopify app view and we'll get that storefront token. And you also can grab your Shopify domain. Storefront token is this one. Way bottom. Yep. Okay. So that one can be there. And then I need the cool. store name, which name. is here. And then I need the builder public key, which is going to be in here somewhere. Yeah. So go over to account at the bottom. Yep. And then let's public. grab public API key. That's the one. Okay. Saved. All right. Excellent. Now cool. back let's to the actually... readme. Beautiful. We already did this part, right? Did this part, we can keep going. We did that, cool, going down, going down. And we did that, we updated our keys. Okay, now we can npm install and actually run our application here and have some fun. Oh my goodness, I am so excited. Here we go, npm install. Oh, and let's do one other thing because the install will take a split second. Let's go back to your Shopify store and actually make sure that the product you have is uh, active for your custom app sales channel. <laughs> Click into the product really quickly and let's just make sure it'll be able to be pulled up. Uh, if you scroll down, there we go. Builder Next.js. Actually, I think it's there. Can you hit? Oh, it's in Next like JS. a lot of these. Let's go in here. Why do I have three of these? Okay, cool. Son of I have a... no idea. I know why. Do you know why? I kept clicking the button. I kept <laughs> clicking the button, Steve. Uh, okay. Well... <laughs> We have the keys for one of them. So we have three builder apps. One of them's um, going to work. It's active for all three. It's good exactly. enough. I think we'll be okay. If we don't see products, we can do a little bit of fun debugging. But cool. I think we're in a good shape. So why don't we jump back to the app and we can do, uh, in the CLI, sorry, and do npm run dev, and get our dev server running. Okay. Oh, after it's done installing. So actually, we need to install. Sharp. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's part of Next.js. Yeah, optimize those images. Jamstack. Jamstack. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so npm run dev. npm run dev. Okay. Sweet, now let's grab, okay, so it looks like port 3000 is being used here. Let's copy that and actually we could see our little site here, which would be kind of cool. In fact, yeah, we can explore the, the structure of the site really quickly. And this, this is getting us started kind of out of the gate with everything running, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you just want to launch the store, you could just launch voice it. Voice command. A good voice command for what? What would what would avoid, what would yelling Jamstack unlock? <laughs> Jamstack with it with jazz hands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so not like Jamstack, but like Jamstack. Jamstack. All right, I'm in. I like that. That's fun. <laughs> There we go. So we have wow. a school video of, this is one of our engineers, Aziz, explaining sort of how to set up some of the stuff, but we already know what we're doing. But this is a page in Builder where we kind of added a little embed code component, but we'll play with that in one second. But this is our store that you can actually mess around with. But okay. we'll do some cool customizations. Let's uh, let's see, next thing, oh, let's copy that URL, that localhost 3000 URL. Okay. And we just need to add that to Builder too. So we go right back to the Builder tab. This is our very last setup step. Go to site URL right on this page, little uh, second row, edit button. Let's just paste that local host. Great. Cool. Let's actually do some visual editing. This is where things get really cool because it's taking components from your code, letting you sort of make pages out of them, passing in the props. We'll kind of talk about all that cool stuff, maybe make some new ones. Okay. And, um, and yeah, anyway, so let's go to the content tab. That's the very top. Uh, icon on that left-hand sidebar. Sweet. And let's go to that homepage. See that little entry there? It's in the middle of the screen. Let's click that. And this should, if everything's set up right, load our sort of local host. There we go. Ooh. Okay. And we can clicky clack and do stuff. Clicky clack go. and do stuff. My favorite, my favorite <laughs> way to work. So I'm ready key, to clicky clack. Couple key things to know. So we're editing on the actual sort of development site now. In production, we did it on production. So you're editing a page. So it's in between your header and footer. You can install these builder editable areas anywhere. Okay. And let's just delete that whole components. Custom code components are cool, but you know the purpose of builder is not to rely on code. So let's just- Yeah, get it out of that. here. 
And let's go go to show more in that sort of uh, right there. Cool. And let's drag, Ooh. choose the, uh, there's like a hero. Grab that hero component. This is a kind of a cool one. Cool. So this is a component in our code. And if you double click okay. on it, we can import insert like the props. So this is a normal component. You might hard code around passing in props and hey, there you go. And you can supply any of these sort of things that the component takes as inputs. These forms are kind of automatically generated and do a lot of neat stuff. But it's not limited to just static stuff. We can actually, when you're ready, drag in some of those product components and actually like display your product on the homepage. And it'll be dynamic, always in sync with your backends, that type of cool stuff. Okay. So that uh, that seems like good, good, good. Uh, so we could set a link URL. Yeah, if you want the whole thing to link somewhere. Okay. Or the CTA link uh, is that read more button. So oh, I understand. That. Okay. Good. So now that one goes thing that's to. Cool. Actually, we'll do a couple cool things, and maybe we can explain sort of like a little bit more in the setup how it works. But why don't we add one of these sort of like product uh, options? If you go to yeah, insert... let me let me verify my email so that we can actually see cool. what's going on. <laughs> um, yeah, good idea. Get started with Builder. Let me click this link. I wait, is this You're intentionally annoying about it? No, no, it's good. It's a it's a good thing to do. Uh, yeah. I just definitely I can't read what the buttons say, so I want to get that fixed. So I'm gonna reload. Cool. And here we go. All right, no more email, no more email reminder, and I have a hero. Um, I'm going to zoom Beautiful. out a little bit too, so that we can see yeah. a little more. Um, I'm on a small screen also, for for streaming, so that we can do that. Let's hit the accept cookies button too on the site. That way, we can get rid of that sort of slide up notification. All right, now we can breathe a little bit better. Let's go um, in that insert tab on the left. If you hit show more kind of above the little gray box, yeah. And let's grab, hover over, um, let me see if I can see this a little better. If you go to product grid, is that the one where you pick products? Yeah, let's drag that product grid in. This one's cool too. And then in a minute, we can go in and fuss around with the code. So double click on that, it's an empty box because you have no products. Hit kind of plus products list. So it takes a list of products as an input and we want to choose one, exactly. Oh, okay, okay. There's your dumpster fire hat. There we go. Look at it go. Okay, and and so I have obviously over here not chosen the best image. Um, it's like <laughs> a little little tiny baby PNG. Uh, it might actually be the one that is on the screen right now at like six hundred percent size. Um, That's okay. But, the benefit is it's a very optimized image. Jamstack. <laughs> Jamstack. Uh, but I'm, fact, ha like, I'm happy. So let's make this smaller. How about that? And this is like this is nice and intuitive too. Like it feels cool. <laughs> I made it so much worse. <laughs> I spoke too soon. What have I done? Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Maybe oh, that one. because I didn't make it square is why that went poorly for me. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, offset limit three. Good link URL. Good, good, good. Okay, so I'm gonna do all of that. What if I make it slim? So maybe we that helps. That's better. Mm, yeah. Oh, nope. I broke it. Uh, that's just a different, I think, variation on what this allows you to do is add a whole grid of products. And this comes from um, Vercel's Next.js starter. So they had all these sort of components with different inputs to display grids of products in different ways. Like maybe okay. if you're selling dresses and the images are very vertical, the other format looks nice. This is what's kind of cool. Two kind of cool things. So these are components in the code and you can decide in builder to make very sort of rigid components they only take a couple inputs and they're very centrally managed or you can make very flexible ones which we can sort of dive into that give more sort of drag and drop control mm -hmm. kind of depends how much of a barrier you want between your marketers and not um did we publish this too oh we didn't publish i was like I was kind of wondering yeah, if this big... was just going to do the thing all right so publish update yeah and now i'm reloading yeah, reload. There might be a cache the first time. Nope, there you go. Wow. That's, a website. That's slick. That's really slick. Yeah. And I can I can see the value in like especially, you know, I I mean I'm I am a developer. I like to code things, but like sometimes I just need to get something up and uh being able to just very quickly get this plugged in and running is nice. 
Um, I'm I'm a big fan of that as a, a general setup. Like, granted, I'm gonna need to figure out how to make these a little more responsive. I'd need more products so I could see what happens when I start plugging things in. But like this, yeah. this feels nice as a, a kind of initial setup here. Um, cool. And it, it looks like this is kind of set up to run in some kind of a grid. Um, yeah, precisely. It's kind of like a, a fancy masonry style grid, mm, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, you're spot on. Honestly, uh, developer myself and uh, more and more, we just build stuff in Builder. It's uh, not just for like the handoff to non-developers, but mm -hmm. just it's really nice to decouple a lot of your content from code deployments. So yeah. even in the Builder app, some of the screens actually are Builder powered because it's just amazing to just jump into the Builder app and just change some text, show a different tutorial on the onboarding and hit publish and move on with your life. Yeah. That way, if we deploy code and roll it back it's not like oh no content changed in general we like the idea of separation of content and code if you have mm -hmm. content in your code the layout and composition of a page and the text inside it eh. if you have that content in a headless cms that's an improvement but a lot of times you still have a very rigid layout and that layout often needs to change on the fly new page new doc new test whatever it is gotcha. and so really if you think about component driven development make a great set of components, make them flexible, and then do your composition of components here in Builder, you could have a lot of new power. Like this homepage, you could schedule a different homepage to automatically go live. So if you want a Black Friday sale or a Memorial Day weekend sale, just schedule that in Builder ahead of time. You don't Hold have to worry up. about Let's the point see, Wait, show me how that works. Yeah, so up at the top, close to, you can make responsive tweaks too. We could play with that, That's which nice. would be fun. But the scheduling, there's two things that are cool targeting and scheduling scheduling is right at the top oh it's going to warn you that you can't you have to pay or i guess oh it says it's a trial feature so you are allowed to use it okay. so yeah you could pick a start and end date just like uh picking like airbnb travel dates and then when you publish that oh. now this version will only be live during that date range holy crap okay so what you're saying is like if i as a developer want to run a sale and i'm like you know this is live now we're ending the sale on friday now I don't have to wake up at, at 11.59 on Friday night to, I, oh man, I just dated myself, didn't I? Yes, I am definitely already asleep by 11.59 on Friday night, but yeah, me too, man. I have to, yeah, I have to wake up and make that change to take the, the sale down. You're saying I don't have to do that anymore. Exactly. And so Ooh. what's nice about it, obviously, is, yeah, pre-schedule it. Everything's good. You don't have to worry about like pushing out a branch and like what else is on that branch or whatever. And also it's not it doesn't have the opposite problem of like, you know, maybe some other ways you might schedule content through an API. They're very limiting. What our customers really value usually is when it comes to a sale weekend, they can change the template entirely. So maybe normally they have like a hero and they have this on mm -hmm. sale day. They just want the page to be sale, 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 sale. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's important. That makes a big difference on how much people buy. If you have to try and cram sale information to the wrong type of template, it just doesn't right. work well. It doesn't convert well. You really want to make it clear when you're running a sale. Yeah. And that's also why, you know, there's many directions we can go with cool stuff we can show. But in this example, that like announcement bar, the top, see that announcement bar section text, mm -hmm. that's also kind content and builder. So you can schedule these things independently. The bar might have special sort of dates and times that shows special information. Yeah. So if you go to announcement bar there, let's edit that. That'll be fun. And this is also made completely bespoke. So we talked about primitives and we showed components, but what's cool about this example is we can actually use the primitives in the style tab this time. Um, we don't have announcement bar not found. I wonder why. Oh, try um. Maybe we skip the. the I, I'm kind of I. I'm no, skeptical okay. of the double slash at the end of the URL. Try, oh, I um, screwed it up. Okay, so I I probably just need to go change here, here. Yeah, maybe let's try that. For localhost three thousand, and then let's go try it again. Yeah, it's very possible maybe we made an update to our, our starter where we maybe renamed the model and didn't reflect in the code. Um, nope. But there we nope. go. It was just beautiful. Uh, we can't, no trailing slashes. So yep. UX feedback, save me from myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, edit that text and let's do some styling too. I think this is kind of fun. So obviously announce whatever you want to announce. Jason is the coolest. Jamstack is the best. Jazz hands for the win. <laughs> okay, and then the link URL 
Uh, I you know what I need? Let's just we'll go here. Everybody can go play with the the boops. Um, cool. Good. Okay. Now I'm gonna edit the style. Yeah, that sounds great. And now you can just go nuts. Cool. Okay. So got it. Got it. Got it. Fill color. Let's make it. Um, chat was stoked about Rebecca Purple earlier. Let's use that. Cool. Um, we've got typography. Ooh, I can choose. Apple system seems good. Let's use that. Let's do a font weight. We'll make it bold. You got to know those unlimited boops are available. Uh, then text color. That seems good. Yeah, this seems this seems right. I think the accessibility folks. How's my contrast? That's good, right? I think it's good. I can test it. I think it's good. Let's find out. One cool thing worth noting on this too is you can set very granular permissions for this stuff. So if you're a developer and you're like, I don't want the marketers changing the styling, give them just the editor role and then no CSS for you. But if you have a designer on your team that wants to go in no and CSS make sort of- for you. <laughs> That's often a fear. It's like, I don't want my marketer touching the font size. That's fine. Only mm -hmm. give the designer permissions to edit styling. Then the designer, you know, we can discuss it if they have time, but the designer can make templates and the templates you can drop on just like those component blocks and edit the pieces. And if you don't have design permissions, you're only allowed to edit like the text, the link and, and you know, no CSS for you. Nice. Uh, question from the chat. Is the scheduling only available on the $35 a month plan? Good question. Let me look it up. I believe it's on the basic plan, um, meaning whatever the cheapest one is. Sorry, we, we kind of dabble with our pricing from time to time. Let me see what our latest pricing is and I'll tell you. Wait, how do I go to the, can I go to the website? Yeah, just go to, um, you can go incognito, for example. Ah, correct. Sorry, scheduling is on the $35 a month plan. But you can get free trial. Okay, I know you didn't ask for this, but you're about to get some opinions. You know what one of my biggest pet peeves is? It's when I yeah. can't go to a company's website when I'm logged into their website. <laughs> you know what? That is how it used to be, and it drove people crazy that they couldn't just type in builder.io and go to the logged in experience. But you're right. We need how do other people handle that? Like a button to say, no, show me the site anyway. Um, I think like either subdomains or you have like a logged in uh, nav bar up top that's like go to your dashboard. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not going to tell you how to do your business. Just that's just me. Uh, I don't know. What do you actually we've got a captive audience. What do you think, chat? Do you want do you want automatic logged in experience or do you want uh, to be able to go to a to like the home page of the site? And while we're waiting for that. We can uh, we can we can jump in here. Let's 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 figure out something else to do. So I and I've made this change. So I'm going to publish it. Good. Yeah. And why now. don't? Oh wait. There's a little caching layer, so potentially give it another load. Uh, we use what's called actually um, Next.js is fond of this too. Uh, we use what's called stale while revalidate caching, meaning mm. we always spit from the CDN and then we revalidate in the background. So sometimes you just need a couple refreshes and then you've got the latest greatest. We people always want, want to be buttons. Fast the stack. <laughs> Luke, <laughs> 90 people. I'm the only opinionated one. That's right, Luke. Just you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. People, some people don't like subdomains. Oh, that's good to know. Put our home page button. Minimal opinions. <laughs> the, the only one for me is like, I, I just ran in this, into this on another site where I went to, um, to figure out how to get a feature that they had that I wanted. And I went to the billing page and it was like upgrade and I clicked upgrade and it just changed my plan and like charged <laughs> me more money. And I was like, no, I wanted to see what the plans were before you changed my plan. Anyways, it was very frustrating and I couldn't get to their pricing page without going incognito. Was, uh, I was like, I, okay, cool. That's fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's actually infuriating. That's a hundred percent fair and valid point. Uh, but yeah, uh, okay. Way, so one cool thing we could do, maybe is open up the code, like for this hero component and start messing with the code. Maybe give the hero component some different uh, second button or something. And then let's, it'll auto reload. It'll hot reload in the builder editor. So we can actually develop and enter props and do cool stuff. Okay. So yeah, let's go to hero. This should be in there somewhere. Um, it might be in, I think we're calling them sections in this repo. The sections are these sort of builder enabled components. Am I, possibly. am I looking right at it and missing it? 
Um, try, you should be able to just go like um, control T or whatever your sort of like new file quick search is. Um, do you not use the, that works. Sections. Sections slash hero, yeah. Hero.builder.ts. Okay, so somewhere in here, oh, do that. sections, got it. Yes. I missed that folder. I was in the, I was in this folder and I got very lost. All right. So I have my, my hero site. We've got our hero component. I see some, yes. some TypeScript. Yeah. So there's some cool stuff going on here. So if you want to look at the component source, you can go to hero.tsx. That will show you just a very normal React component that you might use anywhere else inside of your app. So this is uh, nothing fancy here. This is sort of derived from the style of the, the starter that we forked this from, same mm -hmm. kind of styling, this and that. So it takes props. You use it like any React component. There's no magic here intentionally. We don't want you to build uh, components with builder in mind. We want you to take the components you're already using or just build components like anywhere else and then tag them for use in builder. So if you go back to that hero.builder.ts, we can sort of walk through the how the tagging works, which is kind of neat. One thing that's kind of cool about um, the, the file we were just looking at, the hero.builder instead of the hero.tsx, is we're automatically using Next.js's lazy loading feature. So basically, we're not like preloading any components. Only the components that are used on a page through the drag and drop editor actually load when the client loads. And this is basically where you just say, builder, register a component. So you give it a reference to the component. In this case, we're doing the cool lazy loaded version. We're giving it a name. That's what makes it show up in that little sidebar. And then we're just specifying a little bit more information about the props that we want to allow editors to use for it. And um, that'll generate that nice little form you saw where you can edit a string, you can have, um, like we could be fancy and change the type for CTA link to be URL instead of string. That and way so we'll validate each, it. each of these is coming in as a prop to our, got it. I understand. Precisely. That's yeah, cool. This is really cool. If you want to mess around with the component, you can like open up the builder editor, like that homepage again, where we had the hero in use. And you can go in and change the styling or remove the link or whatever in your TypeScript file and just see it hot reload and update in real time. So you can sort of develop on the components, try sticking the props in. It's kind of a fun way to explore it, like similar to Storybook, uh, sorry, Storyblock, um, or sorry, Storybook, <laughs> Storybook uh, components uh, sort of exploration system. But then you can actually publish stuff with them as well. Nice. And so if I run this, is it running? Looks like, yeah. Oh, it's just not styled. Um, oh, there you go. Yeah, exactly. It. So it's it's down there. It just isn't styled. So I would need to add, uh, is this Tailwind? Uh, yes. Yeah, looks like Tailwind. So drop that in there. There we go. All right, so that's nice and fast. Beautiful. That's that's pretty easy to use. Um, well, cool. So this, I mean, this looks pretty flexible. I, I like it when you just get to write the code that you want to write. Um, this this kind of setup here of uh, of defining things like this this feels familiar. You know, I've seen this done. Uh, I'm I'm you know I'm kind of a fan of of uh, keeping this as simple as possible. I love that we've got default values baked in. Um, now, does this, yeah, this is, this is pretty slick. So where would I find, like, are there, does Builder just have a, like, docs about how this API works in terms of what the available types are? Yeah, exactly. We could open it up if you want to. I yeah, let's poke around in there for URL. a second. Yeah, let's okay. go to, um, go, uh, go over to the left-hand sidebar and go to the learn tab. That'll pump you over to the uh, docs. Cool little fun fact, our docs are all made in Builder, which is actually kind of a lifesaver. So we can just like quickly create and publish all these docs and have hmm. these cool custom components for searching and displaying code for all the frameworks. But let's go search in the um, search bar, just search like React. I think we'll be able to get the um, the custom React component, something something should show up in here. So this is a cool component in our code. And yeah, let's do that top one. Okay. And we've already got this. That's how this is working right now. Um, we yep. pull in builder, builder init, and now the builder dot init is happening probably in like index dot ts here. Somewhere you could probably project wide search it. It's going to be pulling from that environment variable in our case, which is kind of cool. Cool. 
Cool. Yeah. Okay. There we cool. go. Cool. 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 All right. And then we build or enable a component by getting builder. So lowercase builder to init, capital yeah. builder. Got it. Yeah. One's an instance that you can like fetch data and it caches. One's just the, the static sort of class equivalent that you can register singleton versus sort of the instance type of thing. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and this is kind of cool. So you're. So that's like if you were building your own syntax highlighter, got it. Uh, yeah, exactly. Then... The cool thing is that's the same component code for the that syntax highlighter you're looking at in the docs right there. Okay. What does this mean? Like it's this builder component. Yeah. yeah. So the builder component is what you use to say, like that homepage we were editing or that announcement bar. Mm -hmm. um, let's take the announcement bar example. So basically a lot of people might have a hard coded one or they might have it hooked up to a config file or uh, a sort of more minimal headless CMS. And if you just wanted to replace that hard coded sort of announcement bar and just have a builder powered one, you would just say builder component model name equals, I think we called it announcement dash bar. And then you just go to builder, create a model and yeah, we can create something new and that's, too. That's what shows up here. Exactly. Okay, let's actually, can we do that? Let's do that. Cause that seems like something that would yeah. help me um, really like help this gel. So uh, I would call this a section. Where's the announcement bar? Um, it's probably part of like the page layout search uh, announcement dash bar. And I think you'll be able to uh, find where that's defined. Announcement dash bar. That, yeah. Nope, I think nav bar, nav bar TSX, I think. Or try adding the dash. The dash will the dash case format is the one that will give us uh, the model name string. There we go. Okay. So for Next.js, uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah, we're doing a couple fancy things. This is sort of a kitchen sink starter where we show a lot of different things. So in this case, we're fetching the announcement bar context using our plain JavaScript SDK. So if you just use that React component we looked at, it'll fetch for you automatically. Uh, otherwise, you can write the code yourself to fetch it manually. And we mm -hmm. do that in this case. I'll explain why we do in a second. But we fetch sort of the JSON object, and we pass that as the content prop. So you can pass in the content you want the builder SDK to render, where it kind of loops over the JSON and says, OK, you want text, you want your custom component, stuff like that. Does that make okay. some sense? It's a little bit of an abstract concept, uh, so to speak. It's uh, yeah, it's a it's definitely an abstract concept. I'm I'm with you mostly. So let's cool. let's let's do this because I think I'm I'm going to need it uh, for understanding because the part here's the part I'm missing. How does this know anything about layout? Yeah. No, so that's the cool part. Why don't we um why don't we open a doc that will actually explain this a little bit okay. if that makes sense. So if we go back to what we were looking at and go scroll on the left um, sidebar of the docs, scroll to the top, uh, very tippy top, and go to Builder Technical Overview. That'll okay. explain some stuff. So I'll kind of walk you through this if you scroll all the way up. So basically, and let's go down just a little bit, actually, there'll be a code snippet. Okay, cool. So there's what we were looking at, that builder component, model equals page, content equals JSON. And JSON's super abstract, right? So what's in that JSON? Mm -hmm. The example below shows it. So we basically have this array we call blocks. And each block is uh, has a component. So the text block is a text component. It's a proper React component when using the React SDK. It takes options, which are the props, like text and knows how to render text. And okay. then you can have blocks sort of one by one by one. Um, but what's cool is each of the blocks can take components inside as an input as well. So one of the blocks might be called column and the column has columns inside where we sort of render new components in sort of a big tree. Each of these things can also have styling information. So when you click to set text color and stuff like that, that sort of eventually all comes together and renders full pages or nav, uh, announcement bars or stuff like that for us. Gotcha. And Let's see. So this announcement is here. Announcement yeah, content. Set announcement. Yeah. Builder dot get announcement bar. So the one cool thing you're seeing 
So the, the simplest uh, way to fetch the data is just say builder.get announcement bar. You figure okay. out what I should see. And on our back end, we'll say, okay, this one's scheduled to go live tomorrow. So not that one, but this one's live now. So you get this. But what you can also do that's kind of cool is what we call segmentation. You can pass additional what we call user attributes to be smarter about what content you should show. So this is pretty cool in e-commerce land because a lot of times you might want to show like the announcement bar, we pass what all the items in the cart are. So basically, maybe if you have no items in your cart, we say, hey, have um, you know $50 of items in your cart and you'll get free shipping. Once you have $50 worth of items in your cart, we might start showing, great, you're going to get free shipping or add 50 more and you'll actually get you know super fast shipping or whatever the heck you want, uh, if that makes sense. So we okay. can pass information and on Builder, we can actually target different types of content based off of that information. Got it. Okay. And, and so when I look at this in Builder, am I going to see something about item in cart in here? Yeah. You want to take a look at that? Let's go into that. Well, so we'll do two things. So the cool thing about Builder is any piece of content can have many, many entries, you know, like if you schedule different times, you target different ways. So let's start by duplicating our cool purple banner. In the very top right, that's sort of like three dots, hamburger style menu uh, of the web application. Um, Here? Yeah, exactly. And let's go duplicate. Now we'll have a new sort of clone of this that we can make our edits and then choose who should see it instead. Okay, I got you. That's one of the neat things. That's one of the things that I noticed in, in my sort of past job was the uh, a good marketing team should have a huge volume of ideas. And when they're bottlenecked by developers, you know, you can't get a lot of those ideas out. But if you can make many, many copies of content and create different variations that are A-B tests or targeted, you can actually get sort of a lot of conversion value or make, you know, sell a lot more products. Um, yeah, so we'll make our variation and then we'll target it. Okay, so because uh, because it looks like we're getting whether or not there are items in the cart, we should be able to show if you don't have items, we'll show the sale. If you do have yeah. items, we can show this. Perfect. Yep. Okay. So let's so, add the items. At the very top next to scheduling is the targeting button. Targeting. Boom. Target. And yeah, let's add some targeting. Items so in cart. Is, yep. Now, okay, so now, is this a thing that was added? And if so, like, it, are user attributes, like, is there a schema here? I set things? Yes, exactly. And we could look at that too. So what we okay. did uh, for this sort of generated space, we set a schema, which is, um, we're going to be able to target off of items in cart. Um, a URL, so maybe clicking on a collection page might show you more specific information about the collection that you're viewing. Okay. Or if we're editing stuff on a product page, we might say, you know, there's a whole list of use cases, but we might say for this specific product, you know, maybe we sell a mask and a shoe. And for our shoe, we're going to target content, all the sort of editorial about why our shoe is you know, the most amazing shoe ever, but for the mask, we're going to have totally different content relating to the mask. And you can get fancy here. I think we also show collection so we can say, okay, maybe we have lots of shoes. So we can say, okay, any shoe that's in the shoes collection, you know, mm -hmm. we show this. So any shoe has certain information, any mask has certain information. You can kind of go, go wild with all the different sort of use cases here. Got it. So then if I publish this now that we're targeting, um, what I should see is I will reload. Yeah, and this is where caching might, might hit us, so we might have to reload a couple of times, but it should work out as expected. Fingers crossed. Okay, so we have something we in our cart, and yeah. now if I remove it... There you go. There. Add it back in. Cool. So I mean, this is slick, right? Like this is uh, I can see I can see where this really starts to be powerful. I um, I can see I can also see how I could make this very, very hard on myself as a developer because there are lots of move like things move on multiple axes here. So so I do think that there's mm -hmm. like, you know, this is <laughs> this is one of those like probably start by reading the docs because um you know with the 
the variations and you know the, so the the custom components and then the builder components and the extra schemas make sure you know what's available right so if if we dig in here um i want apis probably sure yeah maybe content api which which is the api that i actually want if i want to see like what your schemas are this one um maybe Oh yeah, you can go to uh, probably GraphQL. If you want to inspect the schema that you've created, GraphQL API is probably a good one. And that's where you say, just go to the GraphQL Explorer and you can poke around sort of all your different um, models, the options to query off of stuff like that, which is kind of cool. Okay, and can I just hit this? Uh, I think you can go click on uh, below that video. I think we have a big like oh. world's largest blue button. There we go. Yeah, that so one's given the- above the fold. This one's giving the 11D docs a run for its money. Let's see, which one's bigger? <laughs> oh, I think 11D's got you beat. <laughs> yeah, it was beat. You All know, right. the nice thing though is that button's made in Builder, so I can log in and make it about 10 times the size and publish here on the spot. <laughs> we can get in the competition if we <laughs> wanted to. Okay, so, so then in here, yeah. Um, so yeah so that's our things so we have an announcement bar which have certain fields mm -hmm. uh we have a different query type for if you want to get a list or oftentimes people want one so we have mm -hmm. like one announcement bar or you can get a list of announcement bars for most sites you just have one displaying at a time got it got and it, also got it. per your point about sort of setup um two things that are probably actually useful there one is generally we sort of recommend people start simple and they get more advanced so we made this sort of kitchen sink you know approach where we can show you sort of everything all at once. Um, but most of the time people just hook this up to their existing site just to create the ability to create landing pages. So you don't have to register components. You don't have to do custom targeting, just okay. hook up a very simple code snippet. And now people can start generating landing pages and probably wipe out a good chunk of your engineering backlog just by being able to create pages themselves. Got but it. yeah, these are our Shopify products. So these are data models. This is actually what we're querying from to show uh, your products. If you hit enter now, actually, you might be able to just see um, products without specifying any query details. Okay. Now, yeah, there you go. how do the query details work? I, it's, um, it doesn't look like there's a schema for this. It's just kind of abstract JSON. So where do I go to find how these Correct. work? Yeah, so let's go over to the API docs and I can sort of explain it for you. So go to the content API this time. Um, we actually might have a query example. Sorry, go back to the GraphQL one. We might have a query example uh search uh if you like control f for query uh let's see if we actually have something useful here keep going uh, maybe query colon there we go yeah so what this takes is mongodb style queries and so if you just want to match a key is a value um the contents of uh an object is usually in the data uh, object so uh any content entry in builder has a couple top level fields and then mm -hmm. all the custom fields are in an object called data so, okay so if i run it like this then i could do something like let's do id data colon. id like in that? this case, ID is top level. ID is like one of the built-in properties. Data is the custom properties you can add on top. So yeah, try that. Okay, but then if I change this to be like something else. Comes back, okay, comes back empty. That makes sense. Yeah. Cool, all right, I'm in, that's fun. Yeah, and so this is actually, this is kind of neat too because Shopify has some good tools for querying your products. Um, but when you dump it into Builder, you actually get kind of full database style access. So if you want to do a really integrate query like you would do in MongoDB or another type of database, cool, just run it against sort of the collection of products here. And it's worth noting, you could do the same thing for your pages. So again, people usually start very simple, just drag and drop, make pages. They don't get fancy at first, but then, you know, larger sort of organizations. This is one nice thing about uh, per the point earlier about like monoliths versus sort of Jamstack or microservices, like unbundling sort of services is some people have a lot of complaints that like localization with some of the monoliths can be quite hard. But here in Builder, what's kind of cool is you could add custom fields to your pages like locale and mm -hmm. then you could query off of that. So now you can add localization to your store in almost no time, which is pretty neat. Yeah, let's let's look at that. Actually, I was going to do 
I was going to do something else, but let's, how does localization work? I would just duplicate or do you have actual like localization built in? Yeah, so there's two ways you can do it. So we recommend either doing it with targeting or custom fields. So we mess with targeting. We could do the mm -hmm. targeting way, which will show how those targeting fields are defined. Um, or we can do it with custom fields where you query off of it. Let's do maybe the first way because you asked about it before. So why don't we do that? Okay. So if you go over to uh, on the very left-hand bar, uh, kind of halfway down the screen, go to the accounts tab. Yeah. And then custom targeting attributes. Yeah, hit the pencil button over there. Is that disallowing you? There we go. And then cool. So this is where we define like types of stuff that we take. Each one has like an input type and you can okay. make plugins into Builder to sort of create different input types. And we can just hit new target attribute and we can create a locale one. And that's sort of the, yeah, outline button. Yep. And then I just leave it? I think string is good. Let's make it an enum though, so we can like choose from a list. So if you hit that switch, uh, sorry, string is the type and then enum oh, is enum. Like a sub option next to it. Yeah. And then let's just do like uh, whatever you want. En-us uh, could do, uh, yeah, that totally works. Okay. Oh, uh, each one is, um, oh, actually, oh, no. is it a list of commas? I don't know, let's find out. Let's find out. Press enter. Yeah, I think oh. you want to hit enter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Boom, and hit save. Okay, so now when I go back to my page, I have my home page. Yeah, so that's the standard one. All right. You're on the right track. We'd probably want to make a duplicate and then transfer the content. Where is the where like where is this field? Uh, uh, it is in the uh, targeting options. So uh, very tippy top. Yes. Yeah, and add a new sort of targeting parameter. Locale. And is, locale is. Okay. Boom. All right. And then I go over here and I duplicate. Yeah, I would do that. And I can switch this over to. Espanol, and then uh, <laughs> I don't know what pajamas is in Spanish, so here we are. Um, solamente. Uh, lo siento to anyone who speaks Spanish. Um, <laughs> But uh, okay, so then if I if I save this and we can yeah. we can do that now, um, and then we can do the same thing for French, I guess. So we can we can duplicate one more time. Come back in here, and let's do. Don't tell me you know how to write French too. Let's find out. Um, <laughs> Do you watch that old Dexter's Laboratory episode, the omelette du fromage one? He learned that one saying, and then he was like the most popular. That's not right, is it? Uh, je ne parle pas français. Oh, uh, if it's not right, it's really close, I think. I only have high school knowledge of French, but it definitely rings a bell. Help, help, how did I do? Ha ha! Ah! <laughs> I think I'm wrong, but let's uh, let's... Oh, I was, I was not, I was, I was in the ballpark. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. my French spelling is not my strong suit, but that's okay. We'll, we'll go here. Uh, there we go. I'm going to publish that. And now we have localization. Now, how do I get this to show up? Yeah. So let's go back over to your code. This is sort of, this is perfect. Okay. Um, so maybe we'll hard code it for now. So we don't have to, uh, we might not have time to like sh create a locale picker and stuff. And so yeah. I think if yeah. we hard code it, you can figure out how to you know provide it. So let's do a project wide search for, uh, it's probably gonna be, um, look for page in quotes. That's gonna probably be the easiest way to find um, where we define sort of like model equals page. There we go. Go to model equals page at the very bottom results in like path.tsx. Cool, okay. there it is. 
And so let's go to where we fetch that content. So in this case, we're fetching in the get static props uh, field, most likely. Uh, so do, do, do. go up a little higher. There's probably going to be a builder dot get. Oh, there we go. Uh, Here. Okay. Oh yeah, we have this resolve builder content, and I think. Um, did this uh, get updated or was locale oh, already here? I forgot locale already was a thing in this starter that we're passing through. So we kind of just redefined it, but actually this is kind of a, a perfect example. So uh, we got one step ahead of us. I think we had the original starter had localization. I think we actually removed it from the builder space to not confuse kind of per your point about a lot of bells and whistles. And essentially we're adding it back. So why don't we just click into, um, why don't we like command click into resolve builder content and see what's in there? I think we've created like a little wrapper function around fetching the contents that does what we want. Yeah, there we go. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, we passed the name and targeting attributes. So yeah. Oh, targeting exactly. attributes is what needs to go in, right? Uh, yes, exactly. So you could do like an object spread and sort of pass the locale. I think locale probably makes sense to always pass uh, anyway. So can we can I... either just ignore the facts that we have it would I be able to put it here? Uh, that object is the user attributes we're passing. So a little bit, a little Model bit more name, confusing. Targeting attributes. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I understand. Okay. I well, I only sort of understand. So this locale that's in here is already in here. So if I hard code this to French, I should get the yeah. French version. Yes, we should. Assuming everything's published and uh, we might have a brief caching period, we totally should. Okay. So let's go look out here. Let's go to the home page. Uh, the Next.js dev server in static mode is super slow. Oh, uh, oh, I think that's probably the home page collection. I think it lists the collections on top, and Shopify stores come with a home page collection. OK, so we here go. we go. We've got, we're in French. Then if I change it over to Spanish, and if I change it to English, Cool. All right. So that makes sense. I, I, I'm following you here. I, uh, so we can just kind of pass in these custom things. So then we would figure out how to determine that either from the, the headers, from the, the browser preferences, uh, you know, whatever, or yeah, from a selector, like you had mentioned, um, any of those would give us the ability to determine what the user's preferences were for, for language and, yeah, exactly. uh, and show them the right thing. Cool. This yeah, is, if, I mean, this is if, slick. This is, I, I can see, I can see the the power of this approach, right? Um, totally. Yeah, no, I'm glad it makes sense. And for context too, adding custom localization to a Shopify store with the out of the box setup, uh, the out of the box setup, sorry, is when crazy, crazy adventure <laughs> compared to doing this. <laughs> so one thing that, you know, if any Shopify developers are watching, this hopefully should be a breath of fresh air that's quite simple to just sort of like create and pass params and update it on the fly. And so, and we let you be in control of how you want to manage that, like you said. Maybe it's a cookie, nice. maybe it's for static, like to optimize for static build, we'd probably say it would probably be best to be on like a sub path. That way the pages can be generated, you know, statically serve from the CDN. Again, with something like Netlify, we'll do that in a super duper optimized way. And, um, you know, any other things that don't need to be rendered on the sort of server side, the initial page load, like maybe that announcement bar could be dynamic, or maybe like when you slide in the cart, some content that could be totally dynamic based on cookies or, or other crazy stuff. Yeah. And, and so this, um, I believe we are like, we should be good to deploy this, right? If I want to yeah. get in it, um, and then I'm going to get add pages get commit that and do a um, update locales. Good. Then I can push, uh, or oh, wait, I need to repo create. I love this CLI. We'll make it a public. Continue. It's so cool. I'm glad I got to learn. Remote that. origin so already exists. That. It does. Did you do a fork or something? Oh, I did. Okay, so git remote remove origin. And then we'll try that again. In the Name chat. Um, everyone in the chat's totally right. This uh, 
one way to look at what Builder is, they were mentioning sort of like Weebly and stuff like that. Honestly, those can be great for if you're like an individual SMB. You know, I have friends who have no development skills and they just make a Weebly site or Squarespace or Wix or even Webflow and it's awesome. But then as soon as you want to add like a line of custom code, suddenly it's like, oh my God. <laughs> or like you end up in like Dreamweaver land or in a land where there's just no UI control. We basically try and like macro level, we try and bridge that chasm, you know, whereas today, um, if I didn't know how to code, I could make a Squarespace site. But as soon as I had a developer want to add a little bit of code, a lot of times it's throw away the whole site, start over from scratch, build it, jam stack, but then have no drag and drop control. We kind of try and fill that chasm and say, actually, you can. You can have an interface that's like a Wix, Weebly, Squarespace, or Webflow, but you can control the tech stack, make it fast, hook it up to real e-commerce websites powered by Shopify or any platform and stuff like that, which is I'm cool. I'm glad sort of the followers are sort of rocking that well. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to import the, oh, I'm going to have to Netlify init first. So let's Netlify init. Oh yeah. And you might want to um, copy your .env.development to .env.production. So those keys we added are running in production too. I think what Unless I can do, I, so I have a, I have a plan. Um, cool. So let's do LWJ builder IO. Uh, next build that should work yeah we're gonna we're gonna use the essential next.js plugin anyway so that's all gonna do what we want um cool yep happy with that all right so we've got a deploy key added and then what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna import my environment variables directly into netlify so now these are in netlify which means that we can run netlify dev which yeah. also means that i can now ignore my environment variables because i don't need them anymore so yeah, let's these should all, let's just ignore all of them. Dot end all, get out of here. And then we can get remove, get remove cached, is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. You just do dot even, cool. Okay. Okay, so now if I push this, what should happen, let's let's find out. We're gonna Netlify open this. And are you gonna open the right browser? You did! Okay, so what should happen, let's find out, is it should automatically set up the, the Next.js plugin for us. Um, cool. And this should just work. And does that automatically determine, like just by having a Next config, it, auto, it, it understands? We Yeah, we use some heuristics to figure out what framework you're building with. And if it's Next, we have the the essential Next.js plugin, which will do like, it makes sure that the the stale while revalidate stuff will work on, on Netlify and, and things like that. No, that's awesome. I think for e-commerce sites, stale while revalidate is killer. Having to do uh, full static builds without that revalidation um, is difficult if you have so many products like large catalogs. So that's, that's an amazing feature that you all support. Yeah, I think the 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 tricky part of stale while revalidate is is what we just saw today, which is where you know you you've deployed, yeah. but then you see out of date content and you got to tell people to refresh a few times. And so there there are a few ways to approach it. I I think. Um, where I've been leaning is is on uh, trying to get like you know it it always depends on the the number of of products it depends on the frequency of changes um, yeah but like because of that stale part where people might see something wrong for like a minute or two um, when you're trying to do things like keep your pricing up to date I do it client side mm. um, oh hundred percent yes right and and so a lot of it that's like if it needs to be up to date right now stale while revalidate is actually going to get you into trouble because people will be looking at old data for the first time they load the page. Uh, and if they don't yeah. know to refresh it a couple times, like they're just going to think that something went wrong when they click it on the the one price and then they get to Shopify's checkout page and it's the other price. Um, yeah. Or availability is the other common one. People will do client side for the same reasons. Let's see here. I don't think it's running the plugin. Did it run the plugin? It didn't. Okay. So I need to, why didn't that work? Well, let's just add it. So I'm going to add this plugin, add it to this one. There's a, there's a, a reasonable chance that I have, uh, that I have screwed this up because this is my account and I add a bunch of like 
I'm on a bunch of feature flags right now. <laughs> so there's a decent chance I broke it for myself. So let's uh, let's see what happens here. But this will this will build again, um, and we'll get the uh, we'll get everything up and running. I also want to check just to make sure what version of Next are we using. We're using Next 10.05. That should be fine. The there was a uh, next is tricky because their minor versions cause breaking changes uh, sometimes, mm. and so like ten oh six, I think ten oh six to ten oh seven was had some breaking changes, and then like most recently I think dot nine was a breaking change because they switched from like synchronous config loading to async config loading, and that broke a bunch of stuff. So there's there's challenges, but yeah. So this is this is installing and loading that that should build properly. And then we should good we should be good to go. So while we're doing that, how about we do this? Let's do a let's do another shout out. We've had this show today completely live captioned. Thank you so much to Wyco Captioning for being here. Uh, and that is made possible through the support of our sponsors. We have Netlify, Fauna, Auth0, and Hasura all kicking in to make this show more accessible to more people, which really means a lot to me. Make sure you head over. It's on the homepage every week uh, so that you can go and check that out. And keep in mind that while you're there, you can go check out the schedule. We've got so much exciting stuff coming up later this week on April Fool's Day. And no, this is not a joke. We've got Prince coming back on the show. If you don't know Prince, you should. Make sure you come back on Thursday. This is going to be really fun. We're going to be playing with um, the the event sub API from Twitch, doing some real-time stuff, trying to play with the overlays on the show. Uh, then next week, I've got Cassidy Williams coming on. We're going to troll Sarah, Bre Sarah Drasner, who until very recently was our boss. Um, then... Uh, Nicholas Burke is going to come. We're going to do some stuff with Prisma, which if you don't know Prisma, it's like a uh, ORM-like thing for databases. It's very, very cool. They've been doing a ton of work on it. Um, I'm super excited about that. Uh, yeah, we're going to do Forms and Angular. We're going to have Nathaniel Okenwa back to do custom IVR. And you may have seen uh, Ben Ben in the chat, Ben Code Zen. But uh, I'm going to take a vacation. I'm taking a vacation this year. I don't know when the last time was that I took an actual vacation. But just because I'm going to go on vacation doesn't mean that the show shouldn't go on. So Ben Hong is going to take over Learn With Jason. We're going to do a week of Learn With Ben. I'm so excited to try this out. It's something that I've been kicking around for a long time. Um, it's going to be an absolute blast. So so the week of April 25th? After this week. So after Sean dies on the show, we're going to do a, a week of, of Learn With Ben. And it's going to be so much fun. Um, but yeah, so that's an experiment. I want to see what happens with guest hosts. I think it's going to be an absolute blast. Uh, Steve, where should people go if they want it? Oh, no, my build failed. <laughs> Deploy directory out does not exist. Why does it think that there is... Next config must set the... Oh, okay, so we've got things set in here that we have to fix. We need to set the target. Is it not setting it for us? Target property to serverless. Let's do it. And then we'll deploy it one more time, and this one's going to work. And while we're waiting for this to, to build, uh, serverless, I can spell, save. Uh, fix, add config. That's what I think that might be why this didn't get automatically picked up, is that the next config is, is not compatible with Netlify. So let's get push that. That'll get going. And once that is in, we'll watch this deploy. Here we go. It's going to work this time. Okay. So Steve, uh, everybody's going to go follow you on Twitter right now, right? Right, chat? How many of you have followed? I'm going to refresh this page. How many of you have followed since we started this episode? Yeah, I don't have a lot of followers. Six of you. There you go. All right, let's get the rest. Sweet. Everybody else get in here. Um, Steve, where <laughs> else should people go if they want to learn more about Builder.io? Yeah, I would say just go to builder.io. I think there's a lot of sort of resources linked to there. You'll have to go incognito because of being logged in. Uh, and also actually the other cool spot is our, our GitHub. We have a lot of open source stuff. If you go to github.com slash builder.io slash builder. Yeah, there's a lot of really cool stuff here. There's examples how to get started with your tech stack of choice. I saw some people don't want to use React. You're in luck. You don't have to. You can use Vue, Angular, or even sort of roll your own. We even have a sort of like frameworkless HTML API. You can just hook up into any stack. We have SDKs, examples, 
plugins, um, a lot of cool stuff. And you can leave us GitHub issues and be like, hey, I hate this product or hey, I want this feature. <laughs> and we respond to them all and we're helpful on them all. So I'd recommend anyone to poke around there. You could even check out other sort of related open source projects we have. Like mm-hmm. um, a really cool one we have is a import from Figma. So you can make a design in Figma using their cool auto layout feature, which is a lot like Flexbox and you can just suck it into Builder. Yeah, and just rinse and repeat that. Uh, really and cool. it's cool because you can do that as a Builder customer, just import design and publish. Or also, Jason, if you hit, there's like a code icon up at the top by the published um, text, yeah, by the undo redo. And if you go to get output code, Ooh. you can actually turn any content, yeah, into code of your choice. If you hit that, you'll see tabs for Angular, React, Vue, HTML, yeah. And so you can sort of oh. grab code. This is pretty fun to just import a design and turn it into code. So you don't have to even be a paying customer. Just start using it. And if you're tired of copying and pasting code and having to repaste, hook it up to Builder's APIs, and now you can import publish. So you can see more about that on our GitHub. Play around with the features. It's pretty fun stuff. Very, very cool stuff. Yeah. So um, let's see. This is actually generating static pages this time. So I think it's going to work. Let's... Let's hope. Oh, yeah. This is this is what we want to see. This is from the, the next plugin. Um, so this should be live here in just a second. Uh, and with that, we are out of time. So let's go ahead and find a channel to raid. Steve, thank you so much for hanging out today. This was super fun. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, Builder.io looks really, really exciting. I think uh, I'm, I'm excited to see what people are out there building with it. Um, everybody's going to go follow you on Twitter. Uh, y'all, thank you so much for hanging out today. Chat, it was an absolute pleasure. We will see you next on Thursday. We're going to see you on Thursday. It's going to be great. Talk to you soon, chat. Go to this scene. I got discombobulated at the end. I forgot what's going on. Okay, bye for real. (laughs) 